Good afternoon, and thank you all for being here. It's wonderful to see such a great turnout for this event. So the museum's engagement with Sanjay began, at least on my end, I suppose, uh, earlier this year. And it's been a wonderful, fantastic experience. It started out as one simple element, or that's what it was intended to be, one simple element to go with our Maharaja exhibition. And next thing we know, it became a lot bigger. And we'll go through some of that uh, as we pro proceed in the next hour or so. But uh, I'd like to start out with uh, turning it over to Sanjay and uh, talking about where you begin from and tell us a little more about your background and where you started out your career from. Thanks, Gummer. It's really weird talking to you by a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and we haven't usually been sitting so formally anywhere. So. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty unusual. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for coming. Friends, family, loved ones, neighbors, uh, work friends, thanks for showing up. Um, that's great. Um, so, yeah, I was going to go over a little bit about my background with this awesome remote, um, since Gummer teed that up so well. <laughs> so, uh, as the slide says, I'm an animator, and I really, I don't know what that really means, but I'm more of a, like an illustrator, I guess. I just like drawing. So, there's a photo of me. Um, uh, this is my passport photo. I don't know what's so funny about it, but... Uh, I was born in the UK, and I, uh, my parents immigrated to LA, and uh, I guess I had a tie when I immigrated. <laughs> so uh, I'm Indian, but I'm not from India. Um, I'm, like I said, I was born in the UK, and I grew up in LA. Um, so my parents bought this motel, the Lido Motel, in Southern California. And uh, the motel's right off of Route 66, that's kind of across the street. And the reason you see a bridge uh, in the photo Awesome, I could use the later pointer. Um, the reason there's a bridge in the photo is because there's um, a train tracks that go right by that street, right by Route 66, because essentially there was just a road there, and then the train tracks came. Actually, the train tracks were there, then the road came, and then next to all, all two of those became this 15-lane highway. And so basically during the 50s, uh, this motel was thriving, and then after the interstate came in, the motel sort of died for all intents and purposes. And which is, you know, and then fast forward to the 80s, uh, my parents sort of immigrate, and of course, they see this fantastic money-making opportunity <laughs> on this dead road here. No, ironically, it was, it was pretty tough growing up here. Um, there was really no business. Um, like I said, everybody would just kind of zoom along on the highway. And so we just, you know, I very much just grew up dealing with a lot of sort of unsavory characters. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I left the motel, but basically I was in that motel for like 15 years, and. I didn't, I didn't have a lot of friends, or nobody wanted, really wanted to come over to the motel. It was, I was, <laughs> unless you're a prostitute. <laughs> so um, my friends didn't want to come over and hang out. So I, I spent a lot of time by myself drawing and watching cartoons and stuff, which was OK by me, I guess. And I guess if you do that long enough, and uh, a place like Pixar kind of picks up on like, uber geeks. And so after going to art school and really sort of being like, incredibly dedicated to like, drawing, drawing all the time, um, I got a job at Pixar, and I've been there for like, I don't know, like 15, 16 years now. Um, and I guess it was like during the making of Cars, um, it was probably like 10 years into like being at Pixar, that I feel, finally feel like I had the confidence to sort of move beyond like European art. I'd always been like obsessed with the figure, for instance, like uh, especially the Renaissance art. Like um, I remember in high school, like I was really into G.I. Joe comics, Robotech, all that stuff, 80s, like goodness. And, um, and then my art teacher in high school, she like, you know, sort of like tapped me on the shoulder and she's like, hey, Sanjay, if you really like this stuff, why don't you really learn how to draw? Like, look at this great, like, you know, Renaissance artwork. And I really did fall in love with life drawing classes and things like that. And so that sort of really led me down like the European art path. And I feel like art education in this country, it's very much sort of skewed toward European art, which is totally kosher because I like it. But then at a certain point, I kind of got like a little bit like frustrated because at some point, I, I, never, I, I realized after going to like two art schools that I never got any sort of education on Asian art, actually. It went like um, Greek, or actually it was primitive art, Greek art, and then fast forward to European art. And then it was like American art. And it was just like there was nothing in between. It was kind of frustrating. 
But like I said, after being at Pixar for like 10 years, I really felt confident, or actually I, I kind of felt burnt out with, you know, sort of, I don't know, like drinking from the European art well. And so I really started looking at these Indian miniature books, uh, miniature painting books, and I got really struck by the stories. And to make a long story short, I ended up making my own book called the Hin A Little Book of Hindu Deities, and that's the cover. Um, the book sort of features really cute looking sort of deities in... <laughs> But more importantly, it like sort of gives you like a quick sort of summary and explanation about what each deity sort of represents and symbolizes. And uh, my approach was to, uh, I, I was really sort of, an, I wanted to uh, emulate Sanrio's work. Sanrio is a Japanese company that does Hello Kitty. And I just thought, if I'm gonna do like religious artwork and sort of abstract it, might as well like do it as cute as possible and then hopefully people won't get so like miffed, I guess. It could at and least when be was like, this? Let me just interrupt. Sure. When did this book come out? That's a good question. Um, so I think it came out in 2005, but really I think it was started in like 03 or something. Or, yeah, it was somewhere, uh, like, couple, I mean, I don't know, it's been like a long time in the cooker. I had self-published it actually initially, and I, the first time I ever sold it was here at the Alternative Press Expo in San Francisco. It's kind of a nerd like convention. And um, because people liked it so much, um, uh, an editor who's in the room with us today, she actually picked up on the project and uh, it got sold to Penguin slash Plume and they were the ones who published this thing, which is cool. Um, one of the, uh, sort of uh, a fun little anecdote was that uh, the initial version uh, was called Little India. And uh, the, one of the only critical emails I'd ever received was based on the title of the self-published book. And the critical email was the fact that I had only featured Hindu deities and yet I'd called it Little India, as if to say that India only had one religion. And so that was really a astute point. And so when it got republished, my editor and I decided to change the name to Little Book of Hindu Deity, something more reflective of the contents. Anyway, so make this stuff cute. And so hopefully people are not so like grumpy. Um, at this point, I think I'm like 32 or something. And this is the first time I ever leave uh, or ever step foot on Indian soil. Um, and so, I like took a month trip after it. So after I finished my book, I was like, you know what? I, I really ought to go. And so I went. <laughs> and then um, this is, um, and so like India, if anybody's ever been, it's, it's pretty, it's, yeah, it's pretty awesome. And, um, but the thing that like stood out, the, like the best part of my trip was at the, at the very end, the last like four days, I flew from Bombay to Aurangabad. And there's two UNESCO World Heritage Sites there. One of them is Ajanta, these amazing cave paintings, which I'm sure Gummer knows <laughs> because <laughs> like tons about. And the cave paintings are beautiful. They're um, Buddhist and Jain and Hindu sort of paint, uh, uh, paintings. Um, but that was cool. And as cool as that was, there's like maybe like two or three miles away, not too far from that, is these, I guess it's like the single biggest monolith or something Allura. to that. Alora, yeah. Allura. So. It's, this area is called Alora, and what you notice here is that that's like a freaking mountain, okay? And these Buddhist and Jain monks actually carved away the mountain to make a five-story freaking like monastery structure, amazingness. Um, anyway, it was like the first time I really seen Indian art in, its, in the wild, so to speak, and I fell in love with it. Um, one of the things that really stood out at Alora was this uh, frieze of the Ramayana. And I knew a little bit about the Ramayana. Uh, this, the Ramayana is uh, one of, maybe the, like the second longest epic of South Asian literature. And um, I knew a little bit about it because of my parents, but I really didn't know the story that much. But having done the previous book, I kind of researched it a little bit. Anyway, I saw this freeze and I was like, holy cow, that's like storyboards. This is like animation. This is awesome. And I really like picked up on it. This is like really useful to me. Um, and so I got really inspired by this. Uh, particular bas relief. And so I went home and I started reading the Ramayana. It took me about a year to read all the different versions of the Ramayana. As, so it's one of the longest stories ever put to page. And um, it's, probably, it's probably equally as old too, or not equally as old, it's like it's just as old. Come on, how old? I mean, how long? Oh, like, what is this big, thing? Big question that plagues scholars, so let's not even go there. Right, it is, it, people don't want to commit to like how old it is and how long it is, but it's really, really, I, I've heard, I think the Mahabharata is 10 times the size of the Iliad and the Odyssey combined, and the Ramayana is of that ilk, so it's immense. Um, and so, like, like I said, so uh, these are, right here are these modern sort of uh, adaptations by an Indian author named Ashok Banker. 
And uh, he did a sort of sci-fi, uh, it, it was more of a looser sort of interpretation of the Ramayana. It's seven books, it's like, I don't know, 8,000 pages. And it was published maybe like, I don't know, like eight or nine years ago. And uh, the way I found out about these books was uh, Nina Paley, who uh, is an amazing animator out of New York. She, yeah, totally. She, uh, she made a, she single-handedly animated the Ramayana from Sita's point of view. And if, that, if none of this stuff makes sense, um, maybe you could check out my exhibit. There's like a little bit of an explanation of the, the Ramayana, a little bit of the notes of the story. Anyway, Nina, uh, she was telling me about the Ramayana. I was working on the Hindu deities books. And she had mentioned these books. And so it kind of piqued my curiosity. I read them, and I pretty much fell in love with them. And for that year, I was just reading. Before you go there, I yeah. just noticed that an odd notice? thing, which is this book cover oh, yeah. is a painting that's in that's the true. show downstairs. That's so true. And it's an 18th century Kota painting with the Maharaja of Kota there. But what it's doing on the cover of the Ramayan is a question. That's funny, but right? <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> Maharaja in procession. Good looking out. Good looking out. It's really funny. I, I, I always thought it would be like Dasarat or something, yeah. uh, Rama's uh, father, but good They've point. changed the face of Maharaja of Kota on That's the cover here. True. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, sorry. All right, so I basically, uh, I'm not, I don't like to read, but I, I ended up reading. And like, uh, I like to look at comic books, uh, and uh, the only pictures in these books was right there what you're looking at on the cover. <laughs> So um, I, I just pretty much went down the rabbit hole. I started like reading this thing, and I was like, "Fuck it, man!" I, I was really into it, <laughs> and um, I just uh, I committed to like making this book. So here's a miniature piece, um, and this is like one little moment from the Ramayana. Uh, sorry about the language. I, I'll try to. I I totally apologize about that. I'm going to try to uh, be careful. So um, this is a a moment in the Ramayana. This is the ten. So check it out here, dude. Come on. This is the ten-headed demon uh, Ravana. This is the monkey god, Hanuman. And check it out here, man. Like, they're going to burn his tail. Uh, Hanuman is a spy. He's looking for Sita, and he's found her in Ravana's kingdom. And uh, uh, Hanuman ends up getting captured, and they're going to torture him. It's, like, super tense. And so uh, here's, a, here's a different version based on uh, Thai sort of paintings. Uh, I, that was kind of a revelation to me, was to travel to Thailand to realize how in love with this mythology they are. It's, it's kind of trippy. Anyway, like, this is so cool. So Hanuman's a monkey god, and so he could like, grow his tail as long as he wants, and he makes a bridge, a land bridge, for Rama and his buddy, uh, brother Lakshman to cross over to Lanka to sort of kick butt over Ravana. So they are over here. Anyway, uh, and one of the things that you'll realize pretty quickly when you read the Ramayana is like, how cool Hanuman is, even though it's Rama's story, but Hanuman's a star. Uh, he's a monkey, he's a god, like, what do you want, right? Here's some comic books that I grew up with, and uh, sort of, you know, sort of alludes to how, like, popular Hanuman is. There's even a breed of monkeys in India that's sort of uh, named after Hanuman. These are Langar monkeys. And again, I looked at all of this stuff before I started, you know, sort of drawing this particular sort of moment in the book. This is a sort of a rough sketch, and, uh, you know, it's just basically sort of, it's kind of inspired by Richard Scarry. I don't know if everybody's seen Richard Scarry stuff, but he does these sort of elaborate sort of worlds where you can look into like different parts. So I was potentially playing with Sita being here, and then I wanted to make sure Ravana was here, and like a bunch of demons are dying or burning, that type of stuff. You know, these guys are like pissed. And there's like Sita, she's okay. And Rama's like, all right, sweet, I found you and I'm taking off. He ends up using his tail, because he's a monkey god, to set uh, all of Lanka on fire. So don't mess with monkeys. Um, so after I've drawn something that I like, I just jump right into uh, a program called Adobe Illustrator. And I like Illustrator because it's, uh, it's really geometric and uh, I don't know how to describe it other than like it's, my mind likes it. it I, you could like make simple shapes really quickly and you could color them in a really simple way. One of the use, mo okay, so uh, the thing to know about Adobe Illustrator is that Adobe Illustrator is not meant to create illustrations. It was meant to create typography. And the idea behind uh, this program was whatever you create, you could scale up to the size of a billboard or uh, a size of a 13-foot um, um, building or whatever, or down to uh, a couple of centimeters. So obviously type, typography needs to scale up and down quite a bit. And so uh, typically uh, it would be used for typography. And one of the things that I liked about it is that how precise and sharp it is. So the artwork that you'll see in my gallery, one of the things you'll notice is it's like bulletproof. That is to say, it never breaks down, even though it's scaled up to, I don't know, four feet by 10 feet. Um, and that's because of the program that I was using. Anyway, so once I got a color palette that I like, I start building it. As you can see here, like there's a sketch here, and that was what the idea, that's what I should be building in Adobe Illustrator. These are the vector paths. 
but things change, even though I have a clear bl uh, blueprint of what it's going to be. And if you know the program, you could use a thing called Live Trace, which will sort of build all these shapes for you, but I don't. I just sort of rebuild it myself because I'm an idiot. But anyway, here's what the end result is. Hopefully you sort of get like the storytelling points, which is hopefully your eye goes right to Hanuman first and then maybe to Ravana and you kind of get the idea that his kingdom's on fire. And if you read the story, it's a pretty cool little moment. Anyway, there's the book, it's finished. And only then did I finally like leave my apartment. It took me like four years. And I went to, as a reward, I went to Cambodia. And uh, I finally got to go to Angkor Wat, which was like a big dream come true because again, these guys had been, like, been worshiping, like I'm into the Rama and I tell like my Pixar friends that I'm into the Rama and they're like, Rama what? They don't know what the heck this stuff is. Then you go to a country who like freaking, it's like coming out of the water there. They love it. <laughs> and um, so at the base of Angkor Wat is like this like amazing base relief and uh, this goes on for like a long, long, long time and it's just one little moment of the Rama and what it is is the war between the monkeys and the demons. It's incredible. Anyway, so there's of course Hanuman and there's some of the demons. Sorry. Oh. Gummer, back to you. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, it was your Ramayana book that really got me going because uh, my background is in historical Indian and Persian painting and uh, I'm totally fascinated by the way in which pictures are telling stories and we have ways in which you illustrate extensive narratives and uh, how there is such a variety and dynamic element in all of this because it depends on what moment in a story you pick and how you represent time and how you represent a uh, sequence of activities in order to uh, convey meaning and in order to tell an effective story. So when I saw the Ramayana book, I was really um, very engaged by it, uh, by the storytelling technique, but um, also about Sanjay's process. And uh, we got to meet in, uh, in person following an event that our education department and Allison, who you met earlier, organized, um, after which we met for lunch, and that was about a year ago. And uh, when I started working on the Maharaja project earlier this year, uh, we came up with the need institutionally that, oh, we want to do something to uh, bring a contemporary element into this exhibition, like to not end the story in the 1940s, but to uh, pull it forward um, to today and now. And um, <coughs> talking to uh, other colleagues and brainstorming, and Alison Harding, who's another colleague here, in one of our conversations that came out, what if we connect with Sanjay and see what he's got to do? Um, and so we met up, and uh, rather, maybe it was a phone call, <laughs> or something along those lines, uh, asking him that uh, here we have this uh, upcoming project on uh, Indian art, and we need something for, that would be fun and energetic for the outside of the building. Is there something that you can do? And that's how it began, <laughs> with a catalog. Yeah. So. <laughs> all right, so, that's so where... yeah, like Gummer, like, I thought, first of all, I thought Gummer was a dude, because Gummer just emailed me, but she's not a dude. <laughs> <laughs> she was super nice. <laughs> Sorry, Gummer. <laughs> So yeah, she like emailed me and then like they brought me in for like have lunch and we had lunch. It was kind of like having lunch with a bunch of cur like two curators. It was like pretty unusual. I've never done that. And uh, it was like weird just talking about something that's like so like something so natural to me to like, I'm, yeah, this is how I do my work, draw it. And like I'll learn about it and then I'll draw it, you know. But I don't know, it was kind of weird. But anyways, the fact that they sort of called me up to like work with them was bizarre. Anyway, so here's what we're doing. So they like gave me one word. They're like, hey, you know, would, do you want to do something for the outside of the building? I'm like, all right, that'd be amazing. And, um, but actually, you know, tr truth be told, I was really kind of scared because I was like, I, I don't know what the, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, I'm an animator, you know, I'm like, like I know how to like illustrate, like draw Mickey Mouse and stuff, you know, I don't know. Like, what do, you, what do you mean on top of the building, you know, or on the building? Anyway, but like uh, the one thing that like Gummer had said that like really activated me was the word Maharaja. I knew like a little bit about, actually I didn't know diddly squat about Maharaja, what am I kidding? <laughs> um, and so Kamar and like, uh, she, we talked on the phone and she just briefly kind of gave me like a quick synopsis of what the show was trying to do and 
you know, it was really cool, like how she sort of parsed out like the nuanced role these Rajas had to play and how it sort of changed over time. And I don't know, I was really struck by it. I just, you know, my impression of Maharaja was like big turban, big ruby, and like sweet stash. <laughs> but there was just like so much more that was like there. And so anyway, so I just jumped into, and she was kind enough to send me the catalog, which I read like cover to cover. And I, yeah, I was like really fired up from it. And especially looking at artwork like this, um, I started doing my own stuff. I started doodling. Um, I started working with like profiles of like the Maharaja, courtesans, or the courts. I was also really into like just drawing like this like, kind of like intricate procession, you know? There's so many just traditional paintings that are like full of these things. And I don't know, I was really inspired by this. My girlfriend and I always like, we always struggle with this camel face. It's really hard to draw a camel. And that face sucks. But um, anyway, so I was really into like the Maharaja with like their hunting falcons and stuff. I don't know, like uh, my girlfriend and I were watching Royal Tenenbaums last night. There's like a cool like Mordecai like sequence in there where like Owen Wilson lets go of like the falcon. I was like really into that. And then I, I've always been struck with these Rajas and how sort of they would do these royal hunts. And I was just like, it was just such a beautiful image of like both grace and power. And I don't know, I really wanted to sort of illustrate that. So I, I did it. And uh, they were like, do something for the like outside of the building. I'm like, I don't know what that means. It's, they're also saying like the museum's a historic landmark, so we can't change anything on the outside of the building. I'm like, what? So what do you want me to do? So we ended up making just like a big banner. Now, this is what I pitched, sorry. This is not what we did. This is what I pitched. Um, and um, we thought, I thought it'd be cool to like have full color stuff on the front and then on the back because there's so much traffic on both sides of the building to show sketches. Uh, even though it inspired graffiti, I'm down with that. But like, you know, but it would look less like advertising art, hopefully, and more in line with what's happening inside the museum and speak to the process. And like the cool part was like, I was really into like having these sketches at human scale. And the other thing that's difficult with the museum, I think they've had wayfinding issues to like f have people find the entrance to the museum. And so hopefully this procession would lead you to the right way of the entrance of the museum. I don't know, it's like, this is another sort of mural that, I don't know, it was like freaking, I, don't know, I can't gloss over this. This is like super awesome to see this. <laughs> um, uh, I worked really hard on this mural. <laughs> Um, but it's really cool because what's neat about this procession is that it leads you down this hallway to where the galleries for the Maharaja exhibit is. So it's pretty cool. Like hopefully the bold colors will kind of catch your eye and lead you to where you need to go. Uh, yeah. Back to you, Kamar. Oh. And then, but Sanjay's engagement does not, uh, uh, intersection with the world of museums, uh, does not begin and end with the Asian Art Museum because he's been involved with other institutions as well, uh, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston and Brooklyn Museum of Art in New York, where they recently had an exhibition on uh, the Hindu deity Vishnu. And so you were involved there as well. So can you tell us what, what elements uh, of that exhibition you were doing? and? how that came about? I, a, I just wanted to go to New York. And luckily, <laughs> uh, my agent really pushed really, really hard. Begged, borrowed, stole, did what, I don't know what she did, but she like coaxed like a couple hundred dollars out of them. And so we, I ended up getting a, like a trip to New York out of it, which I was like really thrilled about. So yeah, Brooklyn uh, Museum called me up, which was like, like what? Again, I'm like tripping out over this stuff. But they were like, as uh, Kamar mentioned, they're doing a show based on Vishnu's avatars. So Vishnu has 10 avatars. Um, Vishnu is the god of like preservation and justice. There's like three sort of main uh, Hindu sort of male deities or uh, gods, I guess. There is Brahma, who's a creator god, and there's Vishnu, who's a preservation god, and Shiva, who is the sort of the god of destruction, let's say. Um, anyway, so um, this, since this show is based on Vishnu, Vishnu had 10 avatars, so it's kind of, it's a lot to take in, it's a lot to learn, even for me, like it was really, it took a long time to just understand this stuff. So one of the things that they came up with was this idea of creating these tags of these different avatars of Ram. Uh, avatars, uh, oh, yeah, just to kind of... The James go, Cameron movie. There you are, right. Which is actually where all the figures were blue. Uh, it's skinned quite like Vishnu. But uh, just to, you know, in case uh, there, this is not common knowledge, but... Uh, the gods come down on earth, uh, especially Vishnu does, at various moments in time when um, there is imbalance, instability, or injustice. And um, there are ten forms and ten different moments in time th that Vishnu comes down. And in each of these, depending on the specific situation he is trying to resolve, takes on a, a different form. 
And so that's the 10, das avatar, 10 avatars. And they each have a particular history and a particular physical form that is different from when you see Vishnu just as um, the maintainer of uh, justice and stability. Yeah, it's not like Superman just showing up every time on the scene, like in the same outfit. It's like Vishnu like, reincarnates himself and totally looks different, sometimes as a fish, sometimes as a horse, sometimes as Ram, sometimes as Krishna. So he transforms quite a lot. And so it's, it's as somebody walking in raw or cold to the ex ex exhibit, it's actually uh, a lot of information to sort of understand and sort of get. Anyway, so one of the things that they tried was to put these, uh, I don't know, I guess like these touch screens in there, which is kind of wacky. And apparently, like, there's a bunch of quiz questions that like, you answer, and based on the answers to the quiz questions, you get a tag. This is one of Vishnu's 10 avatars. And uh, this is, uh, this kid, he, he particularly chose the gory avatar of Narasimha. Narasimha is like the lion avatar of Vishnu, who sort of kicks button, does some like gory moves. And so the kid, of course, was totally into it. And then, like, the kid would wear it, or the visitors would wear it. And there, up in that little niche, in that sculpture, is Vishnu's lion avatar. Vishnu's here in the center, and all the other avatars are surrounding him, I imagine. I think mm -hmm. that's what that depicts. Yeah. And so, hopefully, visitors would see the tag, see the character, see which aspect of Vishnu they related to the most, based on the quiz questions, and find their sort of specific deity in the sculpture, which is, I thought, a pretty cool idea. So it's a nice way to create engagement and to, to make uh, people relate to uh, topics and subjects that are challenging and a totally. little um, esoteric sometimes. Plus they get so. to keep the tag and stuff. <laughs> so, uh, well, the other thing that uh, came out in conversation with Sanjay, which really uh, engaged me, was uh, his process and uh, how you get from, get from where you are in terms of uh, being an animator, being so immersed in the world of uh, Sanrio and Paul Frank and G.I. Joe and whatever, to pop uh, culture, pop culture <laughs> in a nutshell, but also relate uh, to the ways in which um, you come to the museums, you go to, you look at books, and you s go back and forth through historical art of very many cultures, and in a way doing something what uh, traditional artists have done for generations, whereby taking familiar stories and reworking those in a visual language that's relevant to the person or the artist himself, uh, or to the time in which they belong. And so how does this relationship between your personal uh, background come through in your work? Hmm. So um, I, think, I think to sort of respond to your question, like this idea of responding to what's been done in through art history, what's been done in sort of pop culture and the stuff that I'm sort of looking at today on maybe somebody's t-shirt or on the TV or in a magazine, um, I think this idea is like, how do you recontextualize this stuff? So um, I, I sort of refer to Hindu artwork uh, or Hindu stories of Hindu mythology. And just like, I think mythology really does need to be sort of revitalized and sort of recontextualized for the era that we're sort of living in. And so, I don't know, I feel like that's sort of my mandate, um, I guess, to sort of, all right, sweet. Yeah, thanks, dude. <laughs> so um, that is to say, like, you know, if you're doing your job right, um, hopefully you're truly honoring what's been done before you and obviously sort of using that as a jumping off point to sort of engaging, you know, people today, which is what's so important. And what I was finding with artwork and the stories that my parents had in their house was that it was really trapped in either dogma or it was just trapped in sort of artwork that wasn't engaging to me. And so, uh, I don't know, I just got really inspired by like, I don't want to say like remixing it, but just like, I don't know, like doing it in a way that like I was like excited about. And so I don't know what that means, but I, I guess to sort of respond yeah. to like the, my work is a total knockoff, that, that's, totally, that's somewhat true, but that's not the whole story. The whole story is really we're all standing on each other's shoulders, right? Every artist, every sort of writer, every sort, every, everybody's sort of responding to what's come before he or she. And so that's all that I'm trying to say is that people sort of compliment me and say, oh my God, Sanjay, this stuff's so creative or like, I don't know, some other like thing, and I'm like, I sort of get angry at that comment because I'm like, no, it's not that creative, actually. It's just the, the carrot and the sort of, the cilantro has always existed. I'm just like putting them together. Maybe they shouldn't go together, but I'm just putting these two ingredients that have always existed together. Anyway, so, um, 
Should I go? Should I show them what we're doing? Yes. So the, the, what he's about to show you next is uh, coming out then after the Maharaja exhibition, um, as we're further along the process, a, uh, an exhibition space a slot opened up in our second floor galleries. And we were trying to figure, you know, working through, well, we already had a few ideas for that, but once we saw uh, the work that Sanjay had done for the downstairs, like, wait, we, we should have more of this, and we should do more of this. And so out of that came the other project, which uh, I hope you all get a chance to see uh, with your wonderful title of <laughs> Go For It. <laughs> Deities. De demons and dudes with stashes. <laughs> it was a team effort. I, it wasn't just me. Like my girlfriend helped. I think the museum contributed. Everybody sort of came up with helped in that title. <laughs> so oh, th what we were trying to do here is to take off on uh, what you were just talking about earlier of bringing the past and the present in dialogue with each other and trying to make the past uh, recontextualize the past as well as to add another layer to the present. And so uh, through this project, we uh, put Sanjay's work in juxtaposition with uh, related works from the museum's collection. And you want to show us some All right, yeah, uh, pictures, installation pictures. shots? <laughs> All right, so like when Kamar, uh, so we're finishing up on the Maharaja stuff, and she's like, hey, I want to talk to you about another thing. I'm like, OK. Um, she was like, how would you feel about having your own gallery at the museum? I'm like, what? WTF, I'm like, uh, like, that took like all of like a couple of seconds to be like, heck yeah, I'd love that. But that, that's, that, is to, that is to say that like, it's not that I feel like my work is in any way museum worthy or museum quality. Wow, I'm getting echoey. Um, it's not what it, dang, it's so echoey. Yeah. Hopefully it's not a problem. Um, all that, you know, the, th the thing that was really exciting about sort of having this work in the museum, having my work in the museum was, um, as I said before, about um, sort of addressing people's sort of, you know, compliments that like, oh, hey, this is so original and or this is so creative. And it was finally like my opportunity to address that in a really direct way in terms of having uh, pieces from the museum's collection, you know, literally right next to sort of my dorky cartoon version of it. And hopefully then like to have people just like stand there and be like, yeah, I see how cool that is at the museum and how lame my stuff is or how well, dorky it is. <laughs> the two um, different ways of looking. <laughs> totally, totally. But at, at the very least, you know, even if you don't think it's lame or dorky, what you can hopefully get out of the having both next to each other is to see that um, this stuff isn't coming out of thin air. It's really responding to traditional art that's been done thousands and thousands of years ago. And so that was my goal is to literally have the people who are interested in my work have them finally make the connections to the stuff that's come way before me. Anyway, so I wanted to show a bunch of uh, slides of the process of uh, putting up this show. Uh, hopefully you guys get a chance to come down. Mm -hmm. um, is it on this floor? It's on this floor. Oh, so there's... good luck trying Once to find it. Once you walk it. through. It's actually... What's so funny? Once you follow the path out of this, this uh, door to my right, you'll end up in this gallery. There's not too many d other places you can get to. But yeah, you'll come across yeah. it, and you, you can't miss and it. And you can't miss it. There's no way you can miss it. <laughs> so hopefully check it out. Anyway, here's some like, uh, shots of the process. This guy is Earl, OK? If there's any reason to check out this talk, it's because of Earl. So I feel like I'm the Earl at Pixar. So um, there's like 1,000 plus people at Pixar, and there's maybe like seven people who really make the creative decisions, in my opinion. Everybody else are like worker bees, you know? I'm a worker bee. And so I feel like Earl is like a dedicated worker bee. He doesn't get credit for anything. Nobody loves him. Nobody like appreciates him. <laughs> and I feel like that's like I'm part of that Pixar army where it's just like, you know, you're appreciated, but you're just, you know, you're, you're just you're essentially executing the, your director's vision. And so you're just you're there to you're you're, you're there as um, to serve. And so, you know, Earl's this guy and he, I just feel like he's the production artist here in this room. And so I was loving this guy. He was like putting up all this work and just put like the way he hangs this these, applies these graphics, it's kind of an art into itself. So I was kind of watching him like, for like two days straight, taking photo, endless photographs of him. Well, um, so this project is uh, focused, and you can probably just keep going uh, with this. It's, it's, one, 
in the grand scheme of things, a relatively small gallery. But the, and we thought it would be a very simple, straightforward project that um, you know, Sanjay already has the art, he's done this work before, we have the objects, we know how to put this up, and it's going to be really easy. Uh, since most of our team in the museum was completely absorbed by uh, the intense installation process of Maharaja, and uh, there was only one of us, Susie, who's also somewhere here, oh, who was kind of sh shepherding this along. But it became quite a, quite a personality of its own. <laughs> But yeah, it was insane. With all of the digital work, and you can just see the... I, I, think what, I, I think, you know, maybe what we're trying to say is that the scope of the project was immense, yeah. and we put a lot into this room, and I guess it's just my nature. I mean, I also want to say that, like, I, he, uh, I noticed that Earl missed the dot of J, or the dot over the J of juxtaposition, and so he, like, cut a piece of vinyl and added it to it, man. This guy is, like, amazing. <laughs> Earl, people, Earl. Anyway, um, so what I wanted, I, I didn't necessarily want to like have a gallery. I'm not inspired by like galleries per se. I wanted to have like a toy store. Like in my like sort of fantasy head, like I, I, I really like, you know, walking into like a Paul Frank store or like a Sanrio store, you know, so I really wanted to make the space feel as like fun and as like lively and as like modern as possible. Um, and I also feel like that had like nods to like, if you go to India, you'll see yeah, just how, I mean, the artwork is just on the streets and it is amazing in terms of like how alive, colorful, rich, busy, noisy, loud this country is. And so I feel like in some ways going from the Japanese Korean galleries, which are all sort of studies in monochromatic, sort of real austere, really low key, and then you go into this like cacophony, Lollapalooza room of India, it's, I don't know, I feel like it's kind of cool. Anyway, like this is Earl, man, he's like, hanging this well. stuff, dude. Anyway, there's like Vishnu. It's one of the biggest images that we have in the room, and it's, um, we just thought it was really a sweet image to sort of greet visitors as they sort of walk into the room. Um, we also, uh, the museum like, was really smart, and they I initially had Hindu deities on the sketches wall. It was, it's, been, it's always been a big sort of thing for me. Uh, one, of the pub, one of my editors had mentioned, she, uh, I'm working on a children's book right now, and uh, I had put some sketches in the book, and my editor, she was like, hey, she's like, that's kind of your signature, huh, is to always put sketches. I was like, oh, I never thought about that way. It was always just, it's always an obvious thing for me. Like, every time I, like, look at artwork from history, I always, like, just make a beeline to the sketches. That's what I want to see. And so it always felt, like, so, like, just automatic with all my work. And so um, uh, the museum had suggested instead of Hindu deities on one of the walls, why not uh, incorporate all the sketches that I did for the Maharaja show? And so... I never intended for these sketches to be this giant in a wall, but it's kind of cool to see them in contrast to the finished work. But they also work really nicely in the back. Yeah. Because you get to see the process in a way that you don't get to see the process in the finally finished mm -hmm. work. I mean, you see this really uh, quick sketch, which is simple lines, but it captures the a great sense of movement and element. And then you move on to other variations of uh, completedness and look at the nose job I gave that guy. See, I was going to give him a, yeah, like yeah. a. It's like and, a. And the way is, oh, oh, what I find fascinating about this uh, wall is just to see, uh, again, using that phrase again, see the process of how uh, your ideas about something have shifted just mm. while you're working on it. I mean, the nose is a good case in point. He had oh, yeah. a much longer, pointier, sharper nose than. Somewhere very soon, it changed to being a different shape. So uh, they, this, to me, adds a really nice compliment to uh, the other uh, Ramayana and uh, Vishnu and deities uh, totally. pieces there. Out of the four walls, that's my favorite yeah. wall, FYI. So hopefully you get to see it. The sketches wall is like super awesome. Um, and keep in mind, these sketches were drawn like with a vector artwork that I described earlier. I sort of I'd talked about how it could scale up infinitely. Uh, the sketches, uh, not in no way. That's it's the ac exact opposite. So these were drawn, maybe no no bigger than this, let's say. And again, they're like drawn while I'm like talking on the phone or whatever. They're just, they're just really small little doodles, and to have them decide bigger than you know human scale is like pretty awesome. And I think Earl and his like crew of printers and magicians, they like I don't know, did something. Awesome so at what this. point then do you move from? something like this to your computer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Okay, generally. <laughs> yeah. Well, here, can I make a point one yeah. second? Oh, yeah, so if you guys go down to the wall as well, I call it the wall, the sketches wall. So here's this procession image that I did in 06, 2006. And this is a Maharaja procession. And check this one out and then check out the image that's down below it. Look at the laser point. It's down here. You can't see it, but you'll see it down on the wall. Don't look. You'll see it down. Uh, well, you'll see it there in the, uh, in the room. You, and the, sort of the, the placard sort of talks about it. That it took me six years to finally, well, not took me. It, I had been wanting to illustrate this idea of a Maharaja's procession for six years. And so when uh, Kamar called me with the word Maharaja, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> For Sorry, those, this kind of reminds question. me of the Air India uh, logo, if anybody knew the Air India logo way back when. These little turbaned fellows. Oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> totally. That's, that's really inspiring. Okay, let me keep moving forward. Yeah. So one of the things we also set up on the ground was we, set, um, we designed this like rangoli. Uh, rangolis are typically done on entryways to sort of invite the goddess in or sort of invite these uh, deities of prosperity. And so you'd have these footprints as well. So the deity would sort of you know, travel on these certain sort of footpaths. And so we just thought it'd be a really fun entryway to sort of enter the exhibit. And there's Earl. Earl's the man. <laughs> All right, so this is, um, I believe, I think it's Vincent's daughter. Oh, of course, Aurora. Yeah. Yes. So she was the first one to dance on the <laughs> Rangoli, so I had to include her. And uh, on the, I, I've been like shuttling back and forth between Oakland and San Francisco, and I, this is 12th Street Center. And like finally, the artwork, like my, I don't know about you, but like there's like my, one of my pet peeves is like there's so much freaking art in the museum. It's like kind of overload. Okay, FYI. And then you go to the Bart freaking station, and there's no art. Okay, it's like a dress of like healthcare ads and stuff, you know? <laughs> and so like, it's always been a big dream. Like, it's really cool to have your stuff in the museum, no doubt about it, but like, I feel like this is so much cooler to have it in the BART station, <laughs> where there's like, you know, like, come on. <laughs> I feel like, like in the museum, you, go, you only got one way to go and that's down. Like, how are you gonna like, you know, top a like, I don't know, a Ming vase or a beautiful sculpture from like, you know, I don't know, like 12th century, you're not going to top it, especially not with my stuff, okay? A healthcare ad? I think I could top it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, yeah. This is family stuff. Yes. So, oh, go for it. Tell us, right, more right, about, right, right. tell us more about your relationship with uh, your family background and your personal artistic expression like do they intersect how and what does your dad think about all this <laughs> totally totally all right so uh this is a quote from ira glass he had a great lecture about storytelling and the quote is when i get when a story gets inside of us it helps us it it makes us less crazy that's a really cool quote um it really resonated with me so um this is my parents motel they still live in the lido motel this is one of the walls uh, uh, they live in the office. They've been there for like 30 years now. Uh, this is obviously JC. Um, he's got uh, like, you know, he's got like a red tilak and he's got like a flower petal affixed to his head. There's room for JC and my parents, you know, Hindu household. This is a uh, Hindu saint. And this is the type of stuff that I grew up with and I was like freaked out with. I'm like, what is that stuff on his face? And um, you know, I mean, like, we could laugh about it now, but, like, some kid, like, growing up between cultures, like, you wouldn't want to invite your friends, A, to the motel, B, to a house full of this stuff, okay? It's kind of freaky. But, um, so, which is to say that I definitely felt crazy in this house, okay? What this is, is that my mom was feeding this saint every morning. So there's food on his face, and it might seem, like, ridiculous, but if you read the stories, if you understand the culture, it's actually... It's, it, makes, it makes a great deal of sense once I began to understand what, they, what it was about. My mother had schizophrenia, so it was never really something I could ever ask her, like, why, why was she doing what was she doing? And my dad, he was just kind of like, you know, angry brown dude, you know? He was just, you, you can't talk to your dad, you know? He, he's not going to talk about this stuff. So this was, you know, he would spend many hours, like three times a day would be, or for me it would be two times a day in front of this little section here. Um, this is his uh, puja area. And uh, there, these are, I mean, this is literally the deities that I sort of, you know, grew up looking at. And as you notice, there's flower petals on all the deities. There's also this um, candle here as well. So every morning, you know, uh, my dad would send me out, or he would sometimes get, get the flower petals from the motel parking lot. And uh, each morning before, um, 
before he would eat his breakfast, before my mom would eat his breakfast, before they would take a shower, they would wash and feed all their deities because they're just as, they're, they're, the most important, they're the most important members of his family, but even before his breakfast and before you know, my mom's breakfast. And so this is something I just never understood until, I don't know, what, like five years ago, three years ago. It's, it sounds so obvious now, but you know, it's, it's a big deal for them, and I just never understood it. Anyway, this is my mom and dad at the beach. Um, and uh, like I said, I think only after doing book report after book report after book report, which is what I call these like dorky books, did I finally get like that, hey, my parents aren't that crazy, that this is absolutely part of their culture and this is absolutely part of the, the stories that I was reading and it makes great sense. How do you personally connect to that? So uh, it was the stories and um, it was through the artwork, number one. And then number two, once I started looking at the miniature artwork and the paintings, I started reading the stories. So one of the, one of the earliest ones was this great sort of painting of Shiva um, with his family on uh, Kailash. Kailash is, uh, is part of the Himalayas and it's kind of the abode of Shiva. And uh, Shiva was there, and this painting was a great little painting with Shiva. And uh, I have a sketch in my sketchbook, and I'll show you at the very end. He's there with Ganesha, little baby Ganesha. Ganesha is Shiva's son. He's there with his wife, Parvati. And uh, he's also there with his other son, uh, Kartike. So it was just like this family portrait, essentially. But I never understood it that way. As you saw through those photos earlier, it was just like this weird artwork with like a bunch of powder on them, flowers on them. I'm like, this is not what I was watching on like growing paints. There was no like part on like family ties that had any of this stuff or silver spoons. It was like, what the? It was just very, it, it didn't make any sense, but once I started, I looked at the paintings, number one, number two, and then I read the stories. And once I read the stories, I was like, oh, I was really struck with how, um, how human these gods were and what sort of lessons they were sort of trying to impart through these paintings. And that was a big connection for me. And it took you 20 some years to get there. Yeah, I'm kind of slow, I'm kind of slow. I feel like this kid, I was like totally process. upset like this. <laughs> so, um, so you have some, sketches to show us or share with us and tell us to, to kind of, you've talked about it, but about your artistic path. Okay. So yeah, I mean like the way I sort of talk about all this stuff, it sounds like I really know what I'm talking about, which I really don't. So um, I, I sh I, the reason I have this quote up is that I'm not religious. My, my dad, uh, so to his reaction to this stuff is, he's not a reader, so I don't think he's ever read any of my books. He's, he seems to be proud of it, but I, it's hard for me to tell. Um, I think he's much more interested in me like lighting candles and having more of these artworks and that I would sort of pray to. And I'm like, Dad, it's not, my, it's not how I relate to this stuff, you know, it's, it's not my bag. But uh, for me, uh, what I like to say is what I like, what I feel like I worship is, you know, drawing and, you know, that's sort of my sort of, I don't know, holy place, I guess. So here's my lame ass sketchbook. Um, here's a bunch of drawings that um, I've done and sort of, there's some chronology here. And the reason I wanted to show this, I just did a talk about a point of view at, to a bunch of graduate students at the CCA. And, um, you know, when I got through CalArts, even when I got to Pixar, I was so like every other art student's like trying to figure out your voice, trying to figure out what you want to express, trying to figure out what you want to paint, all this stuff. And so I knew I was interested in the figures, so I was just drawing figures endlessly, endlessly. And I knew I was interested in design, and so I was like really into like, I don't know, drawing these different shapes. And again, like, for like five, 10 years, all I was doing was like playing with charcoal powder, charcoal powder. And I was also interested in like color and shape as well. It has its roots in animation. I really like Calder as a lot. And I also like children's book illustration. So what I would do is every morning, what I, I'd cut out a piece of a magazine, I'd stick it on like a table. I would like paint some color on there and then take off. So this would be in 10 minutes, okay? And then by the time I got back home from Pixar, the paint would have dried and I'll see what the paint had, would have done on this glossy paper and it would have made something for me. And then I will add to it, subtract from it, do something to it. Anyway, it was, again, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was just reacting. I wanted to, I don't know, I guess I, I really did want to be an illustrator. Um, and I would also bring my sketchbook to Pixar and there wasn't paints there, I'd just be using a computer all day, but what you could find, the closest thing to paint at Pixar you could find is whiteout. And so <laughs> I would use whiteout while, while my animation was recording, I would use these whiteout pens. And so this uh, figure here, it's, it's based on an, an Aang painting, uh, uh, who I was, you know, if you look at a, an Aang painting, it's like kind of amazing, <laughs> the technique. Anyway, so I, I don't know, for some reason I was just like playing around with like whiteout forever. Uh, and, you know, and pastels, but w hopefully what you see here is that none of this is computers. Hopefully what you see here is that none of this stuff is Asian art. 
None of this stuff is um, uh, Hindu art either. I mean, it's really, I mean, this is, it, again, like maybe somebody might pick up on my book and like, oh my God, this guy so knows what he's doing. I really did not know what I was doing. <laughs> um, I don't know, I was just working on a story about a friend of mine. Uh, again, I was working on, I was, I was really falling in love with like uh, painters and uh, illustrators and I was just responding to this every day when I came home from work. In my sketchbook, I'd also be writing and journaling and painting. Uh, I was really in love with Spanish painters. Uh, this is based on a Velazquez painting. And again, you see, like I drew it, I put down a wash, but I didn't finish the drawing or the painting. I just kind of gave up on it and went to the next thing. Um, one sorry. other thing that in, in this uh, painting where you... It's not a painting, it's oh, like stool. Sorry, it's a sketch yeah. that is painted over. This too reminds me of the technique of miniature painting sure. where yeah. an underdrawing is uh, in certain types of the uh, Indi traditional Indian or Persian painting. Uh, the artist makes a sketch and then uh, covers it over with uh, a whitish pigment in order to make uh, to suppress the line right. and then go back over it with uh, with paint right. to refine the image and to go over it. So these multiple layers and this totally. building of uh, of a form. Totally. So, uh, which is to say that none of it's original. It's totally an ancient sort of. It's yeah. Right. It's like old techniques essentially. Uh, and so I was also into like comic books and stuff. So I was also playing around with this techniques because I really like storytelling. And so uh, again, playing around with comics, sequential art essentially. And then finally, I don't know, years and years, years later, I finally picked up these books of uh, Indian sort of paintings. This is by one of my favorite mythologists, Devdat Patnyak, um, and it was based on Vishnu. And again, you'll be greeted by his image when you go to the gallery. And uh, what I think is funny about this image is this is pen. And this is my, one of my first attempts with Adobe Illustrator, that program I described. Look how gross this is. <laughs> anyway, I just really like that it went from this to that. And, but hopefully you could see that it wasn't all computers. And then this is how the work sort of shifted. Uh, this is a traditional Indian painting, but I was really, I, I don't know what the heck was going on, but Garuda is freaking taking out this elephant. And I was like, man, that's interesting. And there's Vishnu with his chakra. And I was like, man, this is really cool. There's an image of Krishna, and I, I don't know, I was really into this stuff. Uh, and this is the image I was telling you about with Shiva, and uh, Ganesh and his family are over here, but you can't see him. And this is, I'm really excited to show this image, because uh, this is the first image I ever made of the Rama iron. Um, so, for instance, uh, there's Rama here, here's his monkey army, and there's Ravana right here, the ten-headed demon. And what I think is cool about this, and this is obviously the demons. Pimples I really want to. demons. Sorry? Pimple demons are yeah. really cute. Pimple demons. They, they have like the measles or something, you know? <laughs> like germs. Um, but I think, so, I, I forgot the year I did this, but uh, this was the first image I ever did the Ram Iron, and maybe it was probably close to eight, nine years later, this was the last image I did of the Ram Iron. And if you'll notice on the book, um, this is what I essentially wanted for the jacket, the cover of the book, but we thought it was a little bit too, I don't know, moody. And so if you take off the jacket cover, you'll notice that this is the case. This is the, uh, the illustration on the case. And so I just love the contrast of that to that. <laughs> but hopefully it kind of illustrates that this stuff doesn't come out of thin air. Again, this was responding to a traditional miniature painting. I wish I, should, I, wish I had a photograph of that because you, you could see that this did not come out of my imagination. I was responding to... Uh, I'm sure a Persian or an Indian, a South Asian artist from the, you know, uh, from maybe two or three hundred years ago to doing this maybe like ten years ago and then this maybe two years ago. This has been quite a treat, <laughs> a visual treat. So. <laughs> All right, let's go back to the thing. <laughs> sure, are we done? Thank you so much. No, no. Is that good? Should we take questions? So this has been, as I say, qu quite a journey and quite a treat, and I'm very interested to see what, you, what do you have next. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I mentioned that uh, I'm working on a children's book. My girlfriend uh, and I have written, and I'm trying to finish up. I got to like December 1st for, for the deadline. Uh, it's my first children's book, or it's our first children's book, and so we're really excited. It's based on Ganesha, and it's a story of how he breaks his tusk. 
So one of the things that you'll notice if you take the escalator to the, th uh, the third floor, you'll be, the first thing that you'll be greeted by is this beautiful Ganesha sculpture. And if you'll notice, he's missing one of his tusks. It's one of its, it's broken. And hopefully, I think he's holding one. I think he's holding the tusk. Okay. Or maybe, you, I think you'll just see that one of, he has a full tusk broken. and one of his yeah. is broken. So what the heck's up with that? Who knows? Read the story. The story's <laughs> going to be cool, okay? It's called Sweet Tooth. And uh, Sanjay just mentioned that on the third floor, uh, we've got uh, a parallel going uh, with the collection objects there. So do, if you do go visit, keep an eye out for stickers that he's designed, which will be on pedestals on uh, many of the sculptures. So there are other artists' versions of Shiva or Vishnu or Ganesha. Or Rama or Rama, or Hanuman. Durga, or any of the other uh, deities. But uh, with that, we'd like to open the floor up for questions. If uh, anybody has questions, please. You get uh, to pick. Somebody in the back there, yeah, who raised their hand. I don't know if there's a mic coming up. Oh. Uh, Alison, yeah. Um, you know, um, on the first Floor, your mural on the first floor, I was so struck by the, uh, so, so elegant, the repetition of the curves in all the figures, and I wondered if that was sort of like a intuitive or was some sort of a formula that you could follow, hmm. like a golden section or something, I didn't know. There was no formula per se. I mean, if anything, I was there's, a, there's, there's like two or three Maharaja paintings, one of them that uh, Kamar mentioned um, was on the cover of that book from the Ramayana. Um, that was a huge source of inspiration for me. Like I remember looking at that painting a long, long time. And what you'll notice about these great procession paintings is that all the figures are doing something specific. And I just really wanted that like sort of repetition of sort of um, I don't know. I guess the the court following the Maharaja. But no, there wasn't any math though, in terms of like formulas. Yes. Hold on, dude. The mic's coming, dude. Do you Wait think your Ram Iron series... Nice pronunciation. Huh? Nice pronunciation. Thank you. Do you think your Ram Iron series would make it into like a story story movie? Since you work for Pixar anyways? What'd you call it though? A story story movie? Toy story movie, oh, toy story. But, but, but Ram Iron, you know. So uh, DreamWorks is working on something. They've optioned this book and so they are doing something with it. Oh, they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. Who knows? Who knows if it would wonderful? A question on this end. Back here. Hey, Ron Gummer, oh. he has the microphone. Oh, he does. Sorry. 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 Um, in your presentation, you made a very scant reference to CalArts. Mm -hmm. And um, my thinking is, hmm, what's up with that? So if you could enlighten those who don't know anything about the institution, what was a typical day like for you when you were there? At CalArts. Yes, at CalArts. So, so CalArts is, uh, so it's, uh, that's the, kind of the nickname, CalArts. It stands for California Institution, or California Institute of the Arts. This is a school that was, it really came into being because Walt Disney uh, wanted a spot to try to train his animators. Before uh, Walt Disney stepped in, it was called the Chenard Art Institute, and it was mainly music and dance. And uh, Walt sort of met up with uh, the woman who was running uh, the Art Institute, and she, they sort of dreamt up this institution that had all the sort of arts under one roof. And um, the reason I sort of mentioned Walt Disney's involvement is that essentially uh, Cal Arts was one of the only schools in America that was training animators. And so, uh, for instance, kind of every major, like, I don't know, American animated thing that you maybe have seen has its roots at, at that school. So John Lasseter, uh, sort of the creative head of Pixar, went to CalArts. He was the first, anim he was one of the first students in the animation program. Tim Burton, who was an animator at the, an the animation program, the same program I went to, went to CalArts. Uh, he was roommates with Pee Wee Herman. He was in the, obviously, the drama school. Uh, Paul, Paul Rubens, I should say. Um, and, uh, you know, the list could go on and on, honestly. Um, James and the Giant Peach, the director of that. Uh, Craig McCracken, uh, director of Powerpuff Girls. SpongeBob, all these creators, uh, Samurai Jack, all went to the school, and they were all sort of, we're all sort of followed in each other's sort of footsteps. You were like, oh, you're in Craig's class? No, Craig was like two years ahead of me. Oh, okay, got it, you're in Ricky's class, so-and-so. It's just this like kind of pedigree of like people who have all sort of helped each other in terms of like build upon you know, your work. But in terms of what a typical day was, is uh, the neat thing about the way the school is set up is that there's like four classes, classrooms down below, 
and then above there's like it's kind of like this space here there's like two levels of studio spaces and so all the animators are literally above the, these four little classrooms and so we'd all work in these little pods and i don't know just draw like stupid cartoons you know and try to shoot them on like the videotape machine and try to make these short films and based on these short films like um there was a thing called the producer show and these producers in la would sort of come out and you know and kind of hire you for jobs. I mean, I, based on my second year short film, which was called Cactus Cooler. It's about a cactus going through puberty. Check it out. <laughs> um, uh, my kind of animation hero, John Crick Pelusi, the creator of Ren and Stimpy, he actually saw it and he's like, dude, I want to work with you. And we ended up working on Bjork music video together, which was like a huge dream come true. And um, yeah, anyway, the, everybody, I mean, so many people at Pixar that I work with all went to that school. So if anybody's considering going into animation and wants to learn about design and traditional sort of character animation, you could do a lot worse than to go to CalArts. Any more questions? Allison's pointing. I'm, oh, I'm very curious about the process of transferring the computer image to, is it vinyl that we have on the walls here? And then what, what about the intellectual property? Do you own the design? Does the museum own it? Will you duplicate these images for other things? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, the images I gave over to the printer and the graphic designer, like um, vector sort of images. And then they, yeah, it's like some sort of like amazing vinyl paper. It's like, I don't know, I love it because it just takes the colors so beautifully. Like, I, I don't know about you, but like the color fidelity of the printouts on the wall there are just like mm -hmm. awesome. I'm like so incredibly thrilled about it. Um, so I don't know, it's like some crazy like adhesive wallpaper stuff that comes out of it and I don't know how they print it but it's amazing and then they stick it on the wall Earl it's like Earl's magic machine in terms of like who owns the rights to like the work I mean I don't think anybody will because it'll kind of be destroyed when it gets taken down taken yeah. down uh, these are like wallpaper uh, it, it's it's a sheet with a sticky bag you take off the protective paper and you apply it to the wall uh, we don't expect this to survive the installation. So, <laughs> because because as you pull it out, uh, who knows what's going to happen to it? Impermanence. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a question. You got the microphone. Love your work. Thank you so much. Um, you. So the part in the title of your exhibit, "Dudes with Stashes," there's so many things to choose from. There's so many options. How do you? How did you come to that element? I'm sorry, like, what do you the mean, like, part. the stash part? The stash. Oh, Sweet well, stash. Yeah, well, the museum, you know, they had asked me to, um, they would ask me if I, they're, they're really excited about showing the Maharaja sketches, and again, I wasn't, I, it just wasn't in my sort of field of view to, like, show that stuff. Again, it was just like, that's the stuff that goes into a folder that gets shoveled into some, like, bin, you know? I was like, what? I'm going to put those on display? And so, because they wanted to show Maharaja sort of imagery, um, the idea of stashes came to me, it was, one, it was probably the second slide I showed the museum when I initially pitched the work. And the reason I showed it to them was one of the things that we do when we sort of, I don't know, even as any sort of illustrator or when we try to create animation, we try to figure out what's the most sort of storytelling iconic image. And one of the things that's so iconic and, um, is a Maharaja's sort of mustache. You could literally just have a profile and if you just design that mustache properly, for all intents and purposes, somebody might guess that it's a Maharaja, you know? Maybe with a few, or, a few more elements, but I don't know. I just felt like it was a very iconic thing for all Maharajas, and so I don't know. And then the idea of stashes was something that the museum was, they were really supportive of because they kind of got that I'm just like some dude versus like, a, you know, an official artist, you know? And so I think it sort of spoke to my like knucklehead nature or lowbrowness, you know? We were also looking for something that was fun and uh, yeah, that's a better word. <laughs> catchy. And besides which, uh, we also work with limitations in terms of word length or letter length. I mean, how, how long can a title be before uh, you, can, you get lost in it? And uh, you have to think of typography, but generally you want uh, an exhibition title to be expressive to tell you what the content is about but it should not go on endlessly so that's the deities demons they 
those two elements, uh, one talks about the, the Hindu deities wall, the demons come in with the Ramayana story, and then uh, we wanted to express the part about the Maharaja sketches, and so that's where the dudes I'll give, credit, I'll give credit to my girlfriend with the title. She helped. She was, I think, the one that initially came up with it. FYI, titles here at the museum. Whew. You have no idea what kind of committee that goes through. Poor Comer has fought many, many, many battles. There used to be a number of the committee members I saw earlier in this event. <laughs> but yes, we agonize a lot about, well, I think we dragged Sanjay through fire uh, with all of our museum um, processes because of, I don't think you had any idea what you were getting into with uh, when you committed to this because this, there are all of these little things that one needs to consider and uh, in installing a show or in presenting it down from title lengths to how high do you put a painting on the wall or how you write a label or what you say and what you don't say. And that's just one little part of it. So thanks for your patience. Yeah. <laughs> Allison. This is really fun art. Um, and it was so great to see it on the front of this old classical building out in front. And, uh, but, it would be also very neat to see the same graphics in India, uh, like in maybe the Museum of Modern Art in Delhi or someplace like that. Huh. Do you have any plans to take what's here over there? Um, well, it'd be great to see what their reaction is. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, should I say thanks to that? Thank you, right? <laughs> that, that's interesting. So um, uh, just recently, the museum was, were, they were hosting a bunch of curators from around the world. Directors, museum oh, directors. <laughs> Directors. Yes. <laughs> from Asia. <laughs> anyway, there was a director from um, a museum of Bombay, and uh, he was kind enough to sort of stop in on my exhibit. He was sporting a sweet stash, I might add as well. <laughs> anyway, um, he, and I was really curious, because, you know, in one way, you know, Gummer, you know, people who are kind of an authority, who, people who really have a depth of knowledge on Asian art, they could kind of call me out on my BS, really. Everybody else, they're just like, they kind of just get bowed, you know, kind of wowed, just kind of get wowed over by the colors, you know? And so I feel like this guy is coming from Bombay, had the sweet stash, and was a freaking director of like a museum there. I'm like, if there's anybody who's gonna call me out on my BS, it would be this dude. And so he came in and he's looking at the work and and he thought he had suggested something similar. He's like, you know, you should consider, you know, take, bring this to India. I was like, really? I'm like, you know, f have you ever been to India? <laughs> okay. So one of the things that I was struck with is that this stuff is as pedestrian as anything. I mean, it's on taxi cabs. It's on like, it's just on everything, you know, and everybody's name is a deity's name, you know, and so it would almost feel like, you know, kind of snow in Alaska, you know, it would just, it would just be like, really? Why would you want to bring snow to Alaska? But, um, but that, that is to say, my friend um, who helped me do some of the production work in the exhibit, he actually corresponded with this graffiti artist named Pooch Rock from France. And Pooch Rock has gone and did some graffiti in, all over India. And one of the things that was funny was that he actually put up an image of Kali that was based, that was essentially my sort of depict my abstract version of Kali on um, one of the sort of highways in India, and he actually took a photo of it, sent it to my buddy, and I'm looking at it. So it's this weird sort of telephone game of I've done something, a French guy responded to it, took it back to India, and did his sort of take up on it, and sent it back to my buddy, who I'm now looking at. So I guess there, maybe, and I've seen knockoffs in markets and stuff, so they got it. <laughs> but not in a museum. Well, who knows where, what will, what's next? It is yeah. me. Might be that might be an interesting idea to actually see it in India. So. Well, one of the things that I'm more interested in is just having the books get there. Like it took almost six years for the first book, the Little Book of Hindu Deities, to finally make it to India, which is so frustrating. The Ramayana, for instance, this book that I poured so much of, like so much of myself into, is still not available in India. Why? I don't know. Publish? Sorry. Really? Well, so a publisher, the world's largest publisher is a publisher called Hachette. They have this sort of an arm in India, and um, they, you know, they, I think my agent was sort of corresponding with them, and 
what the, the rationale that I heard was that this book is too expensive for the Indian marketplace. And so they did not decide to distribute it. I'm not sure how you got yours. Hopefully it's legit. <laughs> but from, from what I understood, um, the, uh, the first book is available in India. The Ram Iron isn't. But who knows, maybe it is. Maybe some through some specialty stores it is. Really? This lady's been persistent. She found it, okay? <laughs> I don't know what you said, dude. Oh, Repeat the question? Yeah. She, oh, well, so her question, her question? If you're gonna answer it, please. Yeah, her question, right? All right, so her question was, she was uh, rebutting my comment of, um, the book's not available in India. She's like, she's like, I bought my copy in India. I'm like, really? I'm like, where? Or I didn't say where, so I'm like, really? It's not a knockoff? <laughs> And she's like, no, she had to tell this proprietor that to look for children's books, art books, religion books, something like that. And I was just saying, she found it. Yes, in the back, please. So just following on from that question, um, I was going to ask you uh, if you thought about going back to the V&A in Britain, where the Maharaja show started, um, to complete the loop of, you know, L.A., India, Britain, it would be great to see an exhibit like this um, in a classic museum in Britain as well. Lady, if you could hook that up, that would be rad, okay? <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get on that. That would be awesome. <laughs> Although the, the curator of, uh, from uh, the V&A, the curator of the show, uh, was here for the opening. And uh, when she saw this work, she really liked it. And uh, she was talking about how they had a similar idea for their marketing materials and other things. And the designs that were shown to her, uh, I think one or two, she did not like at all. And so they scratched that direction altogether and went for uh, the more traditional way of uh, displaying or marketing. for producing a collateral material, which is taking an object from the exhibition and using that uh, for all of the materials, but she really liked it. Anna was... Really? She liked it? That's what she, yeah, she, that's what she said to me. So... Hmm. Well, 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 here in the museum, I'm, I'm a docent trainee, and we've used your um, uh, little book of Hindu deities to do some um, presentations in the, in the galleries, and it's been really fun, <laughs> and it's been fantastic to just line up in front of the um, Khmer, the Angkor Wat, um, images of Shiva and Parvati and actually use your version of the story to make oh. it really accessible. It's been great. Oh. Well, uh, like I said, there's been, well, actually, maybe I haven't said it, but there's been so many people that have helped me in my, like, sort of uh, ignorance all along the way. So, you know, the, if there's any reason that, like, Little Book of Hindu Deities is good is because, A, my agent first took a crack at writing it, and then, B, my editor really helped with rewriting it. And so, um, for instance, like one of the things, if you, I don't know if, you, if people have like the first edition of the Little Book of Hindu Deities, one of the things you'll notice is Rama, one of Vishnu's ten avatars, you know, it's kind of, um, it's just like bedrock that he's always depicted blue. My depiction, he's like pink. And uh, nobody's ever sort of caught up on this, except for like maybe three years ago, like a little kid, a little seven-year-old kid wrote me an email and she was like, how come Ram's not uh, blue? And I was like so mortified. Um, people have caught other typos, but... And my rebuttal to her is that actually I totally made up for it because I spent three years sort of getting it right with a ram iron. Um, but anyway, so there's been a ton of people who have helped me sort of figure out either the program or the stories or the writing. I don't know. I don't want to take credit for this stuff or like the freaking art of awesome artists from like centuries ago that I'm like knocking off. Um, yes. I had a question. You said that you went to India after you did your first book. Is that correct? Yeah, that was the first time I went. So did that in... Uh, influence or change your view afterwards, after visiting, and kind of did it influence your art? Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, that was like a life-changing experience, you know, I mean, I, I, life-changing, that sounds heavy. It was like, what was it? It was, you know what, it didn't, it, def, it didn't influence my art as much as like, it definitely opened my eyes to different parts of the country that I wanted to illustrate, that, that's for sure. It made, it, it really, it changed a different part of my life, which is like, you know, being in America, I never really feel American, because I'm like, my name is Sanjay, I'm brown. But when I was in India, I didn't feel Indian. I felt American there. 
And so it was kind of, it didn't necessarily inform my art, but it felt, informed my sort of identity, I guess, um, more than my art. Um, but yeah, man, like that place is like a powder keg of inspiration. So I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, so I, I showed a slide based on the, the caves and the uh, monolith at Alora and Ajanta. That was the biggest deal for me was to see that stuff. Um, and then number two was just the art on the streets, just the culture itself. The, it's, I don't know, it's mind-boggling. It's awesome. It's just so beautiful. But yeah, that was a big influence. I mean, once I saw that sculpture, I, was, I just dove right into the Ramayana.